House of Mystery presents Inside Writing, the radio show where authors discuss their writing process in all genres. Welcome back into the House of Mystery. And, of course, today I'm your host, Al Warren. Joining me in the host co-host seat, I guess we should say, is um, John Copenhaver. How are you doing, John? I'm doing well. Staying sane, <laughs> I think. <laughs> well, I'll let you be the judge. Staying, stay, staying sane in the U.S. is not possible. <laughs> We're not in that kind of place right now. Um, speaking of not staying sane, <laughs> uh, okay, so we've got uh, an incredible author and, and, and uh, musician, rock star. He does it all. Um, we've got Ronald Malfi. Thank you for being here, Ronald. Hey, thanks, guys, for having me. I appreciate it. You've got quite the life. I mean, I, 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 Greg Defuni actually uh, sent you to me, and I, I just uh, and I appreciate getting good good writers and that. But you you do it all, don't you? You play music and and uh, you you just got it all going on. I, I try to do as much as I can to keep away from my wife and kids. So yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you know this is going to be broadcast. So. <laughs> ah, yeah. Yeah, like they're going to listen to what I have to say. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's true. That's what marriage is, right? They don't listen. <laughs> um, wow. So uh, okay, so you're you're pretty talented. I look at this, and I think. Well, so how did you get into writing first of all? Like, what brought you into the into that uh, world? Yeah, you know, I mean, uh, I was an avid reader uh, when I was younger. Um, and probably around the age 10 or 11 years old, I, I think I remember buying an old typewriter and uh, at, a, at a yard sale. And I just started writing my own stories, just like I kind of did with anything creative back then. I was in the music, drawing, you know, writing. Um, and it, it just kind of stuck with me. And, and throughout high school and into college, you know, I just was always convinced and telling myself, well, you know, once I go to the real world, I'm going to be a writer. I'm going to write novels and that's going to be my job and that's what I'm going to do. And, uh, you know, it was very, you know, very, very glorified idea of what that meant to be. <laughs> um, but uh, and it was also, uh, you know, trying to put off having a real job for as long as possible. So, uh, you know, I, I the habit stuck with me. And, and when I graduated college, uh, by that time, I had already had you know, about half, you know, half a dozen full length novel manuscripts written that I'd written throughout high school and college. Uh, and I just took the best one that I had and shopped it around and ultimately found a publisher for it. Um, and that, this would have been like in 2000. Um, and, uh, you know, I, as soon as I, I got that book deal, I thought, ah, I'm, I, I'm here. I've arrived. This is great. <laughs> and then as you guys, you know, as any real writer knows that, uh, the reality sets in over the next, uh, you know, intervening 12 months. And, uh, I realized, Oh boy, this is not what, you know, I, I can't just sit back and sip my cognac with my leather patches on my, my sports jacket just yet. So uh, that turned into a uh, kind of a, you know, a, a, a two decade long, I guess now, uh, love affair with just writing and, and uh, finding a, a good home for the books and, and slowly and steadily building a fan base. Um, and, uh, you know, I was, I was never one to kind of, I didn't write the one, great best-selling novel right out of the gate and, and could rest on my laurels. This has always been, it's always been a, a job. Uh, and, uh, but I love it, you know, and, uh, it's, uh, it's, like I said, it's persisted now into its, this would be its 21st year, I guess. Mm. Well, you know, writing a, a first novel that's a bestseller is not that good anyway, because usually, uh, the publisher takes, uh, you know, a huge chunk of that money and it, it, then you're, under the pressure to write something to follow up. Well, I, I would take it just to see how it works. <laughs> <laughs> I won't knock it, but yeah. Yeah, well, you know. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I tell you. Uh, so when did you get the confidence to feel, uh, like, well, not so much when, but what gave you the confidence to actually send a book in and to get it published? Like, this is something a lot of writers fight, you know, deal with all the time. Um, what was it about your writing that convinced you? Yeah, that's a good question. I, you know, I never even, I don't know if I've ever even thought of it that way. I, I never, I never questioned it. I just kind of went with it and just said, well, I love to write. I enjoy writing. I think what I write is decent and passable, which is probably the best you'll ever hear me say about it. <laughs> and, uh, and 
you know, for me, the next logical step was then, okay, let's see if I can get it published and to go from there. And, and even with the, you know, the, 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 the shoebox full of rejection slips and, you know, and they used to, sh- you know, back then they were showing up in the mail, you know, uh, and, and you collect all those things. I, I never, uh, questioned, you know, I was never, it was never brought down by the rejections. I was never, you know, uh, turned away from this or felt, um, you know, maybe I'm doing the wrong thing. It just never occurred to me. I just, Kept plugging away and figured, no, well, no, when, when I, when I send the right thing to the right person, that's when it'll click. And that's just how I, I, you know, approached it. So, yeah. I, yeah. Maybe I'm just stupid. No. Yeah, <laughs> I, 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 sounds healthy to me. Yeah. Uh, I, I guess. I, I think it's a good thing because then you're focusing on what you're doing and not so much mm-hmm. the noise outside. Mm-hmm. Um, but when you look back over 20 years, um, to the, to the earliest stuff, even the first book you got published, do you ever read it over and look at it and kind of go, oh, I would do this different, or I would change this? Um, what do you think of that? Al, I, I do that with the, 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 the last manuscript I just edited and turned to my, my agent. <laughs> uh, um, you know, I, my, my first book is, is justifiably and blessedly out of print. Um, and, uh, you know, when you're when you're young and you and you're hungry to to get your stuff out there, there's a part of you, you know, at at, at 20 or whatever, or 21 or however old it was, you're still also learning your craft. And I and I think that at, with that book, my determination to be a published author uh, overrode my talent at the time. Uh, so I, you know, probably. Uh, you know, if that, if that, if that book uh, was fell on anybody's desk at Random House, they would have laughed at me. But I found a smaller press that was willing to take a chance on a uh, – I was a local author in that. They were based in Maryland where I live. And uh, I went with them. And uh, it was sort of a uh, an exercise in trust, I guess, on both sides. But, uh, dude, I don't know. Does that book deserve to see – the mass market? No, I don't think so. <laughs> um, but really, I would say, probably out of all my other things that have been published, I, I, that's probably the only one I feel that way about it. Uh, you know, in that re- regard, um, because I, I recognize, you know, I, I was just still learning, and I think by the time my second book came out, I just kind of had a, a rhythm to it and, a, and an understanding of, you know, what didn't work the first go around and what didn't work in those early manuscripts that I was just having fun writing but but also you know what did work and what what i you know and i was reading voraciously throughout college and right after that first book came out and not just in the horror genre that where i write but pretty much anyone anything i can get my hands on uh even bad books and you learn what's a bad book what, what's a good book why something works why something doesn't what you know what what narrative voice you you most relate to and why certain scenes will evoke certain emotion in you as a reader all that stuff i, I loved you know kind of you know, dousing myself in just any any piece of fiction I could find, and uh, that that kind of changed from book my first published book to my second one. I was I was much more well read and well written, I guess. Yeah, well, I think we learn as we go. We get better, but our hunger gets less. Isn't that true? Our hunger, uh, y- yes. Yeah, you know, it. it to touch on that, it, yeah, that's kind of that's a, probably even more of a poignant statement, I think, maybe than you realize. I, I, I was um, a year or two ago, I was asked to submit a story for this anthology. It was one of these themed anthologies, so it had to fit into whatever little box they were looking for. So I said, you know what? I wrote a story like years ago, like when I was in high school, that the story would fit perfect for this, but clearly it would need to be rewritten so it doesn't sound like an idiot wrote it. So I, I fished the old story out. I read it. And I said, yeah, I could rewrite this and make this really cool and, and this will fit for the anthology. But what I've realized, and, 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 you know, and I rewrote it and it was fine and it, it worked and it was professional and I turned it in. But what I realized is I was unable to capture the pure zeal that I was feeling coming from the, like, I'm, I'm reading this going, I, I can still remember that, that high school kid staying up late at night, hammering on that typewriter, pumping this story out, and that the energy and the excitement in there is something that, you know, now at, you know, 43 years old, I, <laughs> I, I couldn't catch it if I had roller skates, skates and, a, you know, a butterfly net, you know, it, it's just a different time, but yeah, I mean, you're, you're absolutely right. That that's I've noticed that. Well, I think that's part of it because as you read more, you grow more. Because for myself, as I get better, 
uh, and as age comes along, um, why I say when I look back at earlier books is because uh, I didn't know as much. I wasn't as good a writer. And also there's a tremendous amount of pressure you put on yourself when you read good books and you know that they're good and you want to be that good. I think that's a lot of pressure. So we try to get to that place sometimes faster than we really can, you know? Yeah. Yeah, that's true. I, I, you know, uh, that that's the problem with reading great books is I think that if uh, any normal person who wants to be a writer reads a bunch of great books and they, and they go, ooh, well, maybe this is a little too, maybe I shouldn't be trying this. This stuff is too good. You know, yeah. but then, you know, uh, some sociopath like me goes, no, nope, I, I could, I could try that too. See, see if I can do it. You know, it's just like people, you know, we talk about music. It's like some, sometimes somebody, a guitar player will hear a great guitarist and they go, why do I even bother? This guy's so good. But other right. people will hear that same guitarist and go, nah, this, I'm going to work harder. I'm going to work harder. You know, it's just how you're built, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. That's kind of, it's, it's pretty interesting. So why horror? Why, why in the dark realm do you write? Uh, you know what? I, I I don't know if you actually really, you know, for me, pick, and I'm sure you've heard other genre, writers, genre writers say this. I know Greg Hume will put, put backing on it. Um, I don't think you really pick what it is that you write. I think it's just what comes naturally, what you're most acclimated towards. Uh, I love to read that sort of stuff growing up. Uh, I love, love horror movies. And, you know, so when I, when it was just natural for me to, to write that sort of stuff, um, you know, but that said, I mean, the the horror element in a lot of in most of my books is you know arguably slight you know the minor you know the, if you're if you're looking for you know zombies werewolves vampires that sort of thing it's it, it's not going to be found in my stuff I, I really kind of like to delve into the the psychology the psychological aspect of, of characters and and you know even even with this new book I've, I've been working on uh, you know it's, it's arguably a supernatural thriller um but you know i I underscore the word you know arguably (laughs) i guess well so you're looking you're you're kind of taken from the uh alfred hitchcock more about the uh, uh, mental terror or horror than gore well you know what it to a degree and and the reason what i found is like a lot of my earlier books were more firmly horror novels they had clear supernatural elements to it uh and that was unarguable. Um, what I learned, at least for myself, is that I, I felt that the better I got as a writer uh, with character, with atmosphere, description, with telling a story that didn't always need to even, you know, rely on a supernatural gimmick, you know, for lack of a better term, um, that I, I found it harder to go and, and, and still utilize those elements for it because I felt it almost weakened this character structure that I was setting up. You know, if you're, if you're writing this, this, you know, real intense family, family drama, you know, between the characters, it's tough to kind of put a, a, you know, a serial killing supernatural clown into that story. You know, for me, it was. And I, and I, and I, I was starting to see kind of the zippers and, and the, the, the ropes and pulleys behind the stage curtain, you know, if you will, uh, when I was doing that for some of my later stuff. So I, I just gradually, Kind of fell away from just being so overt about it, um, and it just seemed more natural uh, to tell a story that way. Around. So you, your characters—they're very important to you. Um, how do you how do you put them together? How do you develop them, and and um, where do you get them from? Yeah, I mean, you know, for me, characters are generally one of the first things that come to mind before I even start working on a book. Um, and, and sometimes even before story or, or any kind of plot detail, uh, you know, I'll think about, oh, you know, here's a character, what, you know, what, what, how do they go about their lives? What's going on here? Why is this person interesting and, and sticking in my head for some reason? And, you know, I try to think, well, what story surrounds them? Or if I have another story in mind, I go, can this person, you know, if he was in that world, what would, what would happen to, to you know, how would they react? Um, so I'm very, I'm a very character driven author. Uh, you know, I, I think, I mean, that's, that's the hallmark of the story. It, it holds it together. I, I've never been a plot driven writer. Uh, I don't outline or do, you know, uh, the plot machinations bore me and I, and I find them a little tedious. Uh, but I think a good character can move a story along on their own. 
uh, without the need of, of the mechanics of a plot. So, you know, as, and as far as where they come from, you know, it's, it's all over. It's something that you could witness somebody do. It's, it, it could be an amalgamation of, of different people, you know, um, you know, I've got, uh, I mean, this question is a, is a nice segue into this. I've got a new book coming out in July called come with me. And that book came to me, uh, really in two places. The, 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 the first, the first thing to kind of set my mind thinking about it was, uh, the, uh, the book I'll be gone in the dark by Michelle McNamara. And I don't know if you guys are familiar with that. Oh, yeah. Great. Yeah. It's a fantastic book and it's, it, it kind of details her, her surreptitious research into the golden state killer for years. And just, you know, uh, and I was fascinated by the, the story, uh, serial killers are cool. And, and I just kind of liked her, her, what she was doing. I, I just found that impressive. Um, so I, 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 that was sort of like one seed that was planted and I didn't have a story around that. I just kind of liked that concept and found myself reading the book and kind of haunted by the, that, that, the idea of it. Um, and then another thing that happened, uh, unfortunately really was, um, a, a good friend of mine was, uh, shot and killed in a, in a, uh, she was a journalist and she was one of the, the, the five journalists that were shot and killed in the Capitol is that newspaper mass shooting. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, her, you know, that was, uh, it was a shock. And, and in dealing with some of that grief, I, I was, um, kind of, I, I almost unconsciously found myself putting her, who I knew her as a person, um, and how she, and how determined and, and what a, uh, you know, uh, chronicler of our of our neighborhood what, what just a great all-around journalist and a great person and a great mother and, and friend and, and all this stuff uh how she would fit into this world that i had started creating in my head about this this serial kill these serial killings that have happened over decades you know similar to the golden state killer and what her role could have been or would have been uh you know in in in, in that, in any regard, you know, just, just immersing someone of her high spirit and brightness into a world that dark. And I wanted to see what that dichotomy was. And, and the writing of it was really sort of an exercise in grief for me. It was a little, little personal grief counseling because I was really mourning her, uh, her life during the writing of that book. Um, but it also kind of helped me get over a lot of, a lot of issues too. So, so that's a, that's a, that's a downer of a, of an answer, I guess, to your question of where my characters come from, but that it's also probably the best example I could give you too. Well, you know, I think, um, what I want personally, like I, my favorite, uh, horror stories, um, are often about, they really are centered around character and like that, that sort of question of, you know, these big human emotions like grief or, you know, even sort of questioning your sanity, you know, playing out through horror fiction. I mean, is that, um, I'm kind of asking a little bit selfishly because although I'm a crime writer so far, I've been writing a ghost story recently. <laughs> yeah. And so it's just interesting kind of like, you know, to what degree these are, like these big emotions are playing a role that are very specific to this genre. Do you think that's true or what do you think? Well, I mean, I think it's, I don't even think it's specific to the genre. I think it, for me, it's true for anything you write. I mean, particularly from not just a reader, but as a writer, I mean, if you're going to write a book, this is something you're going to spend a good portion of your time with, you know, months to years to, you know, however long it takes somebody to write a book. So it's got to be worth telling. And if a story, if the characters in the story don't have some sort of human element that makes them vulnerable or sympathetic or, uh, you know, any, any, anything, uh, then it, is it, is it worth the, you know, then what are you telling? You know, is it worth the year of your life to write something right. about, about somebody who's, you know, got no issues and everything's fine, you know? Um, you know, you may, again, not to, not to keep throwing his name, but, you know, Greg Gethin, when you had him on, you know, his, his fiction centers around that, oh, man, more than any writer that, and that comes to mind right now. I mean, his stuff is just so mired in grief and human emotion and in uh, loss and, you know, it, it's palpable, but it may, I, you could see why you, know, you read one of his books and it's like, man, it must have, this thing must have been exhausting to write. Um, but it is, it is just so rich on the page. And, and, you know, so, 
sort of like a, a give and take, I guess. The harder it is to write, maybe the maybe the, the stronger they come out that way. Um, I don't know. Doesn't that sort of make you vulnerable? But when you put something that's very personal in there, um, you know, within the story itself, you're kind of exposing something about you, about that's that's very close to you in, in your book. Then, yeah, absolutely, you do, and it's probably, uh, you know the only the only true way I actually even do that I you know my my um you know, I, I, I'm not much of a crier I guess <laughs> you know uh I, but uh you know my my wife I know she reads everything I, I write and I, I I would although it's never come up I would bet that she would think I'm I come across on the page more vulnerable and sympathetic than I do in our marriage <laughs> <laughs> But, but sometimes that's our, that's your outlet, right? I mean, that's your way of expressing it is something internal that you can't do in everyday life. Uh, yeah, I mean, no, no, exactly. So it exists. It's just I uh, <laughs> yeah. don't just throw it around freely. <laughs> but 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 does that you know when we come back to that um, to one of the very first questions uh, is uh, so when you put something of yourself in there that's very personal, um, it's it's like a song. It's like anything. Um, does does it want you know we go back to the confidence where do you have that confidence to expose that to people especially in today's world because you know 20 years ago was bad enough but now yeah. uh, you know you could put a book out and you get uh you know 50 reviews calling you names over something you've exposed about yourself so it's it's a much touchier than it was 20 years ago so uh, it's just so where does that confidence come to go? Well, I don't care. I'll put this out. You know, I like, yeah. you know, pink underwear and butter wings, but you're going to laugh at me, but you're still going to put it out. So what I, that's what I always like to try and discover that confidence in a person. Well, you know, I, writing as really kind of with any art, I think, uh, provides a, uh, a, a tidy little mask for the artist to hide behind. And I don't mean that really glibly, but in, you know, when I'm writing something, um, clearly I'm not writing about myself. Uh, there are parts of me in that story. Of course, there are parts of me that resonate through the characters of that story, but not wholly. And, um, you know, I'm always very comfortable in the fact that what my character says and does doesn't necessarily mean that's what I say and do. This is just that scenario. And, you know, even, you know, John, you, you writing, you know, crime fiction or, or, you know, any, anything like that, you're going to be dealing with unsavory elements. And I don't think if you're writing a story about, you know, somebody who likes to hack the, the, the arms off of women that people would, would fairly go, you know, John must want to hack the arms off of women, you know? Right. So oh, it does, you, know, <laughs> you know what, maybe I, we've just yeah. met, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, so it does provide that, that mask. And, you know, I, yeah, yeah. I see reviews where people are like, Oh, I can't, I can't believe this author wrote this or, you know, and they, they miss the point. And I always see that stuff where it's like, ah, how, that's that, that's going to be a terrible way to, to go through life as a reader, to, to just assume everything is exactly as black and white as the print on that page, you know, to not read the nuance in, in something. Um, so I don't really let, I don't let that bother me. I, I you know. Hmm. Well, know. It's just, yeah. well, it's just, it's just because uh, the story itself and even the characters, you could dress them up and you can mask yourself in, in the right cover and all that. But I'm just saying that, um, the emotion, the pain, the fear, a lot of those um, very strong points that make a good psychological story in in horror or anywhere um, still come, they're still real. That's how come they work. So they still come from you. Yeah. And I mean, it, you know, it, it's, and that's true. I mean, I, I've, it, you could probably look at it, at a, at a particular book of mine at any given time in my career and re, and someone who knows me can probably can relate that to where I was personally in my life at that time. Uh, you know, I wrote a book uh, a few years back called the night parade and it's going to sound a little prophetic now, but it's, it was about a disease that, that basically was wiping out the uh, you know, mankind <laughs> and, and about a father and his young daughter who were on the run from the government uh, because the daughter is the cure for the disease and he doesn't want to, turn her in as a guinea pig to, to save mankind. Um, and 
the idea came to me for that story right around the time I was, you know, finding my way through fatherhood. And, um, and I remember telling the concept of that, of that story to different friends of mine said, Hey, it's a father who doesn't want to turn in his daughter to save humanity. And some of my friends said, that's terrible. He, he's a selfish guy and he should do the right thing for the good of the people. And other people said, no, that's, he's doing, he, his only, his only, uh, responsibility is, is to the safety of his daughter and he should run. And I realized, wow, so totally different responses to, to that story idea. And that's what cinched me. I'm like, I got to write this book because it poses that question. Two, two different people can read that book and come away with completely opposing viewpoints on who this character is and, and whether or not they agree with what he's doing. And again, that goes back to character and, and the dilemma that he's in. But at the heart, it's a, it's a family drama about this father and his daughter. Um, it's, fu it's funny because that's kind of, um, well, not funny, but it's, it, you can, can compare it to even today's world, you know, with the pandemic and believers and, and non-believers, maskers and anti-maskers, people that, it, just the, the different points of view on the same thing, and it's where people live and where they get their, it, it, it's, it's just how they live, you know? Yeah. You know, well, that so, book is, even now that's, you talk about going back and looking at your stuff. It's a little chilling to to me to to read some of that now, even though it was just I think it was published in 2016. Um, but uh, you know, I I had the research I did for that. I you know I knew a guy who was an epidemiologist. I spoke to him. I I, I called the World Health Organization. I called the CDC, and I basically basically said, Hey, give me. I'm, I'm writing a novel about a fictional disease. Give me death numbers. <laughs> that wouldn't that wouldn't decimate the population, but basically bring polite society to a halt. And the numbers they gave me ultimately were like COVID numbers. And they but they were like, but that won't happen. Yeah, I'm like, yeah, that's fiction. That's fine. And then when COVID was happening, and I'm watching, I told my wife, I'm like, I hate to be that guy, but buy some canned goods, man, because this <laughs> um, this is I, I heard this four years ago. <laughs> it's your fault. You did. <laughs> <laughs> and, and even everything in the book, I mean, I've got, there's issues with the, with the masks in my book. And, it, you know, and all it was was if you sit there and you think, all right, really, how would this play out? That was one of the things that struck me. And in my book, it's people who, um, they run out of masks because everybody buys them up. They don't know the, if they work. Um, and then the, the, the only other part is instead of the anti-maskers, I had this movement of people who, who couldn't get their hands on a mask but wanted to show uh, that they were, uh, in, I guess, in solidarity with that I, with that idea, and they would wear these paper plates over their head, faces with eye holes cut out. So you'd see all these weird people walking around with paper plate masks. So I thought that was kind of a pretty good visual. But uh, yeah, well, you know. it's not too far off. <laughs> yeah, no, I know. It's, it's scary. <laughs> it's crazy. coming out um, yeah so let's talk about that now your 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 main character i guess is aaron decker um so let's let's talk about aaron where did aaron come from 
Uh, and yeah. and yeah. how did you develop a character like that? So Aaron came on the heels of first developing Alison Decker, who is uh, sort of the behind-the-scenes main character of that novel. And Alison is Aaron's wife. Uh, and Alison, in the first chapter of the novel, is, is killed in a shooting. And um, really, what I what I first liked about the characters, before to get into the, the story idea, you know, was here's a woman who is dark and mysterious and, and intelligent and secretive and has, has um, uh, you know, but she's also frenetic and she's, she's got her, she lives in a house and throws her clothes all over the place. And, you know, her mind is like a, like a tornado. And she's, and I'm like, well, who, who would be her husband? Right. And, and, and I thought of what almost would, would be like almost comical. Like these two would never live together in real life. Mm -hmm. and, and I even, you know, he was thinking about me and my wife were very opposite. Um, so I, I, I real, I started forming Aaron, her husband in my head as this kind of um, low key introverted uh, bookworm as a career. He translates Japanese novels into English. He's, he's studious. He's, he's constantly turning the light off behind her when she leaves a room, you know, and I, and I sort of like that thing where she's the fireball in this relationship and he is just the, the steady, the, the, the quiet in the background, right. Puttering away. And, um, the reason what, what appealed to me about that relationship is, uh, because she, she dies in, in the beginning of the book. Um, he uncovers a bunch of, uh, secrets basically from her past soon after her death. And he has to not only get out of his comfort zone to find answers to, to those secrets, but basically adopt his wife's persona in order to, to reach the end of that road. So it's, it's his journey. And, and, and in doing so, you know, it starts off with him feeling like he doesn't, he, he didn't know the woman he married at all. She, she had all this, all this darkness behind her. Um, and, you know, the irony there is the further he, he, he learns that she was so different than the woman he realized, the closer he becomes to her because he kind of adopts her personality to learn and deal and cope with that stuff. Um, so that's what appealed to me uh, with those characters. And once I knew I had those two together, I knew it was a, a, the perfect fit for this story, which is really a, as you know, a, 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 a gritty uh, serial killer uh, you know, I guess you could call it a, a thriller or a mystery or, or however you want to, you know, say it. But, you know, against the backdrop of something pretty heinous, uh, this guy is totally out of his element and he's sort of being guided by, you know, the, the remnants of, of his wife's spirit, uh, to, to kind of piece things together. So you've got, um, quite the interest and you, you kind of use this a lot, the supernatural, is there a reason for that? Is there some sort of experience that you've had or something that brings that out in your books? You, you, no, you know, no. Um, I, and I, I wouldn't even really say I, I believe in it. Um, uh, although, who knows? I mean, you know, I don't know. Uh, no, well. <laughs> but uh, I, I think that there's always, I, like I said, I, I, that's, that sort of thing appeals to me. I like the question mark that it, that it posits. Um, and, you know, to, to write a you know, straightforward, uh, you know, for me, uh, thriller without some hint of that element in there, it seems to not fully, you know, shade it all in perfectly for me. You know, I always like that hint of, well, it could be this. And really with a lot, with the past few books I've written and this one included, a reader can walk away and, and say, there was no supernatural element in this at all. This was just a, a, a confluence of circumstance that our unreliable narrator perceived to be X, Y, and Z. Um, and I love that. I love the fact that you can take what you what, away with it what you want as a reader. Um, so that's sort of the the tightrope uh, genre wise that I've been walking with the past several books. Um, it's just it's, it's something I find fun, um, and it's also uh, it, it's tough to do. It's tough to know how much or how little to put in to to arrive at that conclusion for your reader. Is there something you want someone to get? Like so, if if, if I buy come with me and i read it um, what do you mean if if what <laughs> <laughs> well i mean I, I thought i'd get one but that's um you know but if you uh, so if someone picks up your book and reads it like this and they take it home and 
besides the on top story here that you've got, is there a subtext? Is there something you want that reader to take out of that book? Uh, I mean, look, there's there's always subtext. Um, you can enjoy this book surface level. Um, and I think the interesting thing about Come With Me is if anyone is so inclined that that if you finish the book and then read it a second time, the you'll 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 walk away with a completely different perspective of what you thought this book was actually about. Um, and again, it's stuff like that that is that I tax myself with as a writer because I I find it tough to do and I want to exercise that writing muscle and see if I can pull it off. Um, and I do that frequently, frequently with a lot of, a lot of my stuff. I had a book come out, uh, back in 2011 or so called Floating Staircase, are arguably one of my better, you know, my best selling books, my fan favorites. You know, people seem to like that book. Um, and on its surface, it is a, uh, you know, a ghost story about, uh, about a man trying to solve the what he believes to be the murder of a young boy um, with, uh, on its surface, a, a, what we're to believe to be a happy ending and a resolution. Um, when in reality, if you read it really closely, uh, there is a middle, there is a midpoint of that book where you realize that he is, he is a horror writer and he's narrating this book and he's fixing in the mistakes that he's made uh, to make you, the reader, think this ended ha- happily. And some readers, I, I get such a, a joy from readers who are able to pick up that nuance below. Because people who say, I love Floating Staircase, it's such a great book, oh, it, it, a happy ending. I'm like, okay, you got some out of it. <laughs> and other, but I love the reader who goes, Floating Staircase broke my heart. I'm like, ah, you got it. You know, and it's very subtle, um, but it's there. And again, it's, you know, I, I, I like the acrobatics that, that are required as a writer to, to kind of sew something together that neatly where it can get you know it can get overlooked by some people I, I, you know but uh, yeah so yeah I, a lot of subjects do you think that ghost stories by their very nature are kind of always playing with perspective a little bit you know like you think about these sort of great kind of standards like you know the haunting of hill house or you know you know turn of the screw they're always dealing with sort of a perspective which could be interpreted right like you know you're not you're not sure if you're seeing there's really ghosts there or it's just the, the sort of madness of the characters. I mean, it, that sounds sort of like a little bit what you're describing the sort of, you know, the playing with perspective. Is that something you do a lot of, or, or it seem is you seem to enjoy that playing with that idea, but I was curious. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I love uh, a nice, juicy, unreliable narrator who is bringing a lot of baggage to the table and makes the reader work uh, to think of, to think what it is they're actually being told and what's happening. Um, and, you know, ghosts, I think, are a perfect metaphor for that, a metaphor for, uh, you, you know, all the all the misery and grief and fear and and mental anguish that that we go through in our real lives manifesting in this, you know, spectral, you know, the, the supernatural entity who may or may not be there, who may just be a projection of that character's own, uh, you know, horrors, their own personal uh, concerns and beliefs. So, yeah, I, and I think ghosts are, are the perfect uh vehicle to, to do that sort of thing. I love, I love a good ghost story. Yeah. What, so what, what, what gets Ron Malfi going? What gets you excited? Um, <laughs> I mean that in, in, in the world today, what influence you? What, what, what will strike something up for you? Is it, um, you know, other books, uh, music, movies, people? Like what, what will light the fire? Yeah, you know, uh, you know, uh, probably just like anybody. I mean, good books really. I love a good book, and I love to. I feel energized and, and invigorated to work on my own stuff after I've read a good book. Um, I, I love music. I'm, I'm, you know, as you mentioned in the intro, I'm, I'm in a band. I guess I don't know what the hell we're doing this year, <laughs> but um, you know, we we uh, that's and that's a whole different, you know, for me, a whole different artistic muscle to flex. But uh, but I love being. Uh, in a room with, with three other guys, uh, writing on writing music, performing music, going on stage, uh, you know, taking something from that's purely in your head as a sound and, and laying it out there and recording it for other people to, to hear and play and hum. And, you know, I, I find I find that creative process really invigorating. Um, 
You mentioned people. Not so much. I don't like people. But. Yeah. <laughs> oh, they're terrible. Uh, nice <laughs> glass of scotch. That'll, always, that'll get me there. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, people are way down on that list. You know? <laughs> My dog right, is higher. Come on. It's uh, <laughs> I'm terrible. Um, wow, that's pretty interesting. What's your advice for someone that's just writing? Brand new writer. Uh, I mean, you know, the old go-to is to, to, to always be writing, you know. Um, but I'd say read everything you get your hands on. Um, and and don't, don't just limit it to whatever genre you, you feel you want to write in. Read everything and see and learn what makes a book good. Learn, learn what makes writing bad. Um, learn to, you know, was it Hemingway who, who said, you know, a, real, a good writer is born with a built-in. Oh, my. Detector. And I think the more you read and learn to detect that, the more you're honing your own. So when you sit down to write, you know when you're, you get to a part. And I, we, look, we've all been there. You get to a part, you're like, oh, my. And I'm just phoning this in now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Story of my life. Um, <laughs> well, no, I just, because I, you, you, you must, um, you were talking about true crime, like uh, murder and stuff, and how, so you must read a lot of other um, storylines, like true stories like that, to, to influence you as well. Sometimes I do. Uh, not not a lot. Uh, I, I, I do like some of the, um, you know, the docuseries and stuff like that where they kind of go into that. But and, and I do prefer them when, you know, I got an affinity for serial killers. Those are always cool. Uh, and I like some of the more, you know, ghostly, you know, what actually happened here, like we were talking about before. Um, but, you know, as far as reading a lot of that stuff, you know what, I really... I really don't read so much of it. Uh, I, I like the, the, the atmosphere and the tone that they bring to a story. Um, so a lot of the fiction I read comes across as, as, a, as a crime uh, novel. Uh, but as far as the actual true crime stuff, I, I don't read too much of it. Yeah, there's, there's a difference. Um, I've, I've got 20 books out now in true crime. It's a different way of writing. Um, what's important to you? Is it, is it, is it the actual grammar, the, the style, the structure, or is it the story? In, in reading those books or in, in my own writing? In, in both. Like, how do you translate? Like, so when you read a book, what do you, what's a good book to you? Is it, is it just having it all, or is there something that – is it the story that they're trying to tell you that, and the way they get it? It's, it, it's really – I mean, it's the same stuff that appeals to me as a writer and, and sets me to write something is what I also enjoy most in, in, a, in a book. Um, I, 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 like, like I said, I like good character. I like good conflict and drama. I like, you know, believability. Uh, you're, you're damn well better be using correct ground. You know, I don't you – know, <laughs> there better be very few typos and, and, the, and the grammar should all be there. Um, uh, you know, I'm probably an anomaly in this genre when I say that it doesn't appeal to me if somebody tries to sell me their book and they go, oh, it's it's like a bullet from page one. It's so action packed that <laughs> doesn't, uh, you know, it doesn't appeal to me. I mean, action packed works well on TV, I guess, for me, but. I don't. I, I can't read six pages of a car chase, you know. So I, I don't know. Yeah. Um. It, I, I find more uh, more enjoyment in in the sucking me in slowly into the atmosphere of your story yeah. than to than to spring it on, you know, hot and hot and loose or whatever that is. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you on that one. I think that there that that the uh, I I I love the sort of action that's in the writing, not necessarily. You know, is there explosion on the first page? <laughs> exactly. Right. Yep. Location. Um, so the scene, the place that you're writing about or in, the characters, mm -hmm. um, are they? It, 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 is the location a, a character to you as well? Do, do you write it as a character? Yes, I do. I, I, I think of it, probably most of the books I've written, it, it serves that purpose. Um, you know, the, you know, we're, we're all, we're, we write, you know, we we feel that we're, we're creative creatures and we're trying to put something on paper straight from our mind. And I think particularly if I'm going to create a town or a city, which most of my, my books feature prominently fictional towns, uh, let's, let's, you know, flex that, that, you know, thought muscle and see how cool we can make it. You know, I don't want to just duplicate you know, New York City and, and say that's what it is. I, I, I think I have a lot of fun creating 
uh, unique locations and, and then the people that are that come from those locations. Um, you, you know, it come with me. There's a, there's several uh, like small towns that are, uh, Aaron uh, visits throughout the book, and they're each one is just kind of weirder and, and a little off kilter and creepier than the next. And it's not just bizarre stuff. It's just that weird sense of just that weird twilight zone. Where are we going? How, how far into the realm of bizarre are, are we going to travel for, you know, through the, the course of this book? So I, I was conscious of that with all the locations in that novel. Um, you know, and, and the, my, my book uh, prior to this one uh, is a novel called bone white and it, uh, features a fictional town in Alaska, right below the Arctic Circle, called Dred's Hand. And the, the legend for, around that town is that it was an old mining town that the devil came to, to reside in, and he will occasionally possess people who wander astray through the woods. Um, and I just like that kind of urban legend feel to it, and just, uh, you know, I, so I had a lot of fun with that town, this, this Arctic uh, you know, frozen tundra of a of a an old, of an old collapsed mining town where where all these superstitious locals have nailed giant crosses around the perimeter of the town to keep the devil out, and where the the, the local children wear animal pelts as face masks to trick the devil into thinking they're not people. You know, stuff like that that I just find really really enticing as a as a reader and a writer. <laughs> so, what's your favorite type of uh, horror to read yourself? Or, or even movie? Do you like uh, older classics, or are you kind of uh, is there modern writers that really kind of get you going? Uh, for movies, a lot. Of, I mean, look, movies are probably my my, my favorites are going to be the older movies. You know, anything from you know what we what we consider to be the classic horror movies, um, all the way up through. Uh, I don't know if I've seen a good one lately, but you know, it seems like the better things were were done back when I was growing up. Um, Writers, uh, you know what, writing, I, I read so much that I, I always find really good writers and really bad writers at any given point of time when they were right, at any, at any point in history. Um, you know, I grew up on Stephen King and Peter Straub and, and all that stuff. I love that, that their books. Um, but, I mean, you know, I, I read uh, Stephen Graham Jones' uh, The Only Good Indians this past year and it just blew my socks off. I, it, it, it's great to, to see... Someone who still, in, you know, in this, in, in 2020, when I read it, um, just taking, a, just being able to write a horror story in 2020 and making it completely unique and, and heartfelt. And, you know, by the time I was done reading, I'm like, this guy just tapped into something that just, it was, it just felt so new to me. Uh, so, you know, it, it, writing kind of goes across the board. Uh, but, you know, for every great book like that, I read like two, and I'm like, what the hell? And, uh, and, I, and I'm one of those, I don't know if you guys are too, but I'm one of those guys, like, like if I start it, i got to finish it. I mean, unless it's just, just killing me. But even if it's, you know, i just got to finish it. it. It's like being infinitely hopeful. I'm just always hoping <laughs> it's going to turn around. <laughs> yeah, well, it's like watching a car crash. Like, where, where are they going? <laughs> You know, it's it's kind of strange how it goes. You know, you talked about the Mac, McNamara book. Um, I could only get through half of it. Hmm. <laughs> but people love it. I, I I thought it was I thought it was good. I, now I, I did cheat. I listened to it on audio. Yeah, that's so. what I do that a lot too. Now I just yeah. I have the audio because I I had cataract surgery, so I'm getting old. <laughs> But I will say, I mean, the thing about that book is there's no, I mean, there's no conclusion to it, so there's no ending. Right. Um, and I, but, you know, I kind of knew that going in. I just, I, I, I was more interested in the framework from a writer's standpoint. So it's hard to kind of just be a reader sometimes. I was interested in the framework of how that book was laid out because I had already started thinking of, of my own story kind of, you know, and, and I wanted to say, all right, how, how was this done? You know? Yeah. Um, but I, I, you know what, to each their own. You no, know, I think the best thing about it was that um, she expressed how consumed she was. Yeah. And that really came across, and that was kind of the key to that, I think. Um, but, you know, hey. You know. I love stories about it with obsessed characters. Give me an obsessed character, and I'm, I'm in. And so I, I, was, I was in on that one, because she is obsessed. You know? <laughs> yeah. That's why. That's why I read that more than anything. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. So, um, Ron, do you have a website or a place that you want people to come find you? 
Uh, you could, well, I've got a website. It's uh, RonaldMalfi.com. Um, I don't even know when I last updated that. Uh, <laughs> but I am, you know, I'm on Facebook. I'm, I'm on Twitter. Uh, I've been told I'm on Instagram, although I've never done anything. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, you can find me anywhere with that stuff. Also, you know, if you're interested on the band side of things, our, our band website is VeerBand.net. Um, and our, uh, our drummer is also our marketing guru. And he's also my brother. Uh, but he, you know, at any, at any given time at that website, you can find like cool giveaways. And he's always, you know, stuff to kind of keep the band relevant this past year. Uh, you know, with, you know, a bunch of, bunch of different goodies and, and he sends out guitar picks and t-shirts and just contests and, you know, all that sort of fun stuff. So, uh, yeah. How, how, how has the, uh, the last year affected you and your writing and your uh, ability to perform? The, you know, the, the writing, um, it, it, it's been different only because uh, normally I would be sitting home doing this alone and my kids would be, my wife would be doing her thing and, and my kids are at school and, you know, now everybody's in the house. So now it's sort of like, you, you got to split your time a little differently. And, and I've, you know, we've all kind of learned to do that this past year uh, between work and, and, you know, family and all that. Um, from a, from a, a mind, you know, from your, just that headspace, you know, early on, it was tough to overcome the, okay, going to sit down and write this fictional spooky story when I could look out my window or watch the news and go, oh, my. I mean, the real world is just awful right now. Like, I, how do I even, what am I even doing? You know, so there was a, a little bit of that. Um, I, you know, I got over that hump, you know, uh, because I had to to work on the edits for Come With Me. So that got me out of it. And it did, I did kind of get some, I wrote a, like a novella during that time. Um, and some short stories and started outlining another, another novel. Um, and I also, I've been, I've been doing some uh, TV stuff, uh, on the side. So that was, you know, you don't want to drop the ball, uh, with that stuff. So I, I, I kept busy, but my heart was, it was hard to get my heart into it, you know? Yeah. And then on the other end of it, you know, I, I talk with my editor and I'm like, you know, moving forward with this next book, I said, uh, what what are you seeing authors do in regard to COVID? I mean, are they referencing it? You know, and I've read stuff where they do and seen movies where they do. Uh, but I said, you know, are they referencing it? Does it become a, a big issue? I mean, does everybody have to wear a mask in this book? Uh, you know, and her her response, which is what I was hoping for, her response is, I don't think we're we're there yet. I don't think people want to read that in everything right now. Yeah. Um, so I'm happy to pretend it doesn't exist in my fictional world. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I just wonder if, it, it, you know, when you got a lot of, uh, you know, if you, if things are stressful, and I ask this of a lot of writers, like, so outside of your house, you got, you know, um, you know, you got riots going on, and you got protests, and you've got all the political unrest, and then you've got the COVID and all this stuff. So when things are really kind of dark or unsure outside, does that make your writing become darker? Oh uh, boy, I don't know. I don't know if there's that sort of a direct correlation, or if the correlation is almost in the opposite. You know, where you try to brighten things up. Uh, you know, I I've noticed that less with my writing, but more so really with with our mute with the band's music. So I write uh, the majority of the of the songs for the band, and you know, uh, we, our first album came out at the end of 2018 and we toured on that for the, for much of 2019 with our last show being January of 2020. We didn't, you know, before anybody knew anything was going on. And it was funny because that, that whole, the album is called Apocalyptic Baby and the whole <laughs> album concept is, is, uh, the apocalypse. So, uh, and then the follow up album, which, which we already had planned was, uh, going to be the antidote album to the the, the apocalypse, the the up the more uh, human sounding, uplifting, more you know songs to drag us out of that. So those those were like the two album theme, and so I mean, so to be like thrust now in the middle of this bizarre reality with half an album being recorded where you were, you know, you're almost like looking into a crystal ball while you were working on this thing of Jesus Christ, did we cause this? Is this some cosmic, uh, you know, wrench in the system here? Uh, you know, so that's been weird. So I, I have noticed that a lot of those earlier songs in the beginning of, of, 
you know, 2020, uh, started off kind of dark and dreary and, and that I've noticed that my writing has somehow become brighter and poppier. Um, as, as far as the songs go. Yeah. Uh, and I, and I don't know why, I don't know if it's just, you know, enough's enough seeing the news and you just want to hear something up, more uplifting or, or what it is. Um, but I have noticed it more, more cleanly in that than I have in my fiction. Yeah. Yeah. It might be more obvious. Hmm. Well, that's, that's, it's quite a, it's quite a interesting road and in life you lead. So, uh, um, thank you for coming on the show. Um, our guest has been Ronald Balfi. Uh, the newest book coming out in July is Come With Me. Um, glad you were here. Well, I appreciate you guys having me on. It's been a lot of fun. Thank you. To find out more about our show, guests, or to listen to past shows from our archive, please go to www.houseofmysteryradio.com. Show's over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Well, good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back.